Right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth week of our 10 week semester 2023 academic year. We are doing philosophy now. It's PHCL 102, which is uh, philosophical questions. My name is Dr. Nancy Miles, Bafo GP, a senior lecturer of the Department of Philosophy and Classics, School of Arts. College of Humanities, University of Ghana. This is the City Campus Class Group 2. We are going to delve into the question of epistemology, focusing on Descartes meditations one and two. Hopefully that content can be shared with, <clears throat> excuse me, other groups of City Campus and also main campus. We want one of you to read for us. What I have put in the slides, I hope after my preliminary ranting, which is off our record, of course, but very useful to you, you will do the needful and engage the PDF proper of DCAT. That is also in your resource too. What we are engaging now will be the slides, the notes have made out of that to help you grab the content. Go ahead, sir. Samuel, please read for me. Oh, please, you are muted, Samuel. Yeah, so you may want to unmute first. Okay. Uh -huh. lecture, lecture says epistemology, the question of knowledge. Good. You see that I put my initials there, so we move quickly to the next. Go ahead, sir. The questions of epistemology. Number one, what is knowledge? In the bracket, traditionally justified through <coughs> epistemologically. When you make a statement, I know the lecture, it means you believe it, it is true. There's a lecture, and you can justify your true belief, support evidence. Good. So that means someone is just reading for us. We are venturing into another branch of philosophy now. We set off with metaphysics where we looked at Plato's reality by reading his allegory of the cave. I want to mute all now so when you have to read any of mute so we have a very fine background. Now we saw Plato's allegory of the cave. We saw Ortega's man has no nature. We discussed the theory of nature. The man's being does not consist in what it is already. Man makes choices. The choices inspire the creation of himself, both economically and fundamentally, but metaphysically. So your being, who you are ontologically, your metaphysics, your reality is not defined. You choose it. That's why I have spoken a lot extensively like this. When you choose what you want to be, at least according to Ortega, and then what? you make choices to create it. So you can never remain stagnated and think that you have created an essence for yourself. You, the choices never end until perhaps death. And so if you choose, you will become. So if you saw the text, I said, read that PDF too. It's a three page PDF. I've done a recording. I don't know, I think it was your group or, uh, it was a city cam campus group because we did it online. I mentioned, read it. In the text, he says, let's take a guess to it. He says what? You may even choose to continue reading this paper that you are reading, or you may stop right here. It's still your choice. If you were to finish reading it, you would have become something else after reading it because this will add to what you are. If you, you stop to, you have chosen not to be this, it's always your choice. This is also in Ortega showing that you are what you legislate your being you choose it you are the novelist of your own being so if your life were a play you are writing your own life okay? and and so i think that's one or two questions from folks some sent emails some some approach me after class especially those who are religiously inclined christian muslim what have you would say that oh doc does it does it mean then that god God doesn't have any purposes for us or something. I said, ah, why wouldn't you think of reconciling the two? The, pur the purposes may be there. I am a person of faith, a strong person of faith, I believe. 
I am I am what I am because I believe God. I mean, it's hundred percent God. But does that mean I won't wake up early and engage my students and teach them? I won't look at my notes and brush through it a little at least so I can give a delivery because I say I know who I am. Dun, 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 dun. I know who I am, so that's all. You you have to start even the one that knows that he has been called to be a prophet must meditate to hear from God. You have to do something about it. Contribute to what you have been made to be. You are the head, not the tail. Is what God says he has made you. Now addressing those who had concerns about faith. I think I've put it in the other recording. See? You say, oh, but you are the head. You are. It didn't say you will be the head. Those who quote Bible, I can do that one. I don't know other scriptures. Uh, bear with me. You are the head. Yet you are getting further. And that, that. And Ima. F-D-E. Perhaps. Yeah. Others don't. They are getting a, but you are, you are getting father. Father is not the head. Father is the tail. F for father. But you are the head. So if it is just about God has made me this, you see, you are the you, you are the righteousness of God. Look at your life. You see that. You, uh, what's the other one? I wonder, the barren will not remain in the land. Of course, barrenness is not just about physical, biological birth. I'm just quoting what you have been made. Purpose, design, nature, so to speak. But you still have to play a role. Otherwise, you will let God be a liar. That's the, to the people of faith. So what? So even where you have been made the head, not the tail, you are rich. Eh? So that Christ took away your poverty, so you will become rich. All these scriptures we are quoting now. If you like, quote that scripture. Keep quoting it and sit in your room. In the morning, keep sitting there, do nothing, and see whether you will be rich. It will never materialize. The word will forever be settled in heaven. It will never materialize. Not because God is a liar, because you made him a liar. We have, you have, we have neutralized yeah, the potency of the word by our tradition, the way we do things, and ineffectiveness. So the, to the people of faith, I received, I think, two or three mails, which were trying to say that there can be nature, what you have been made to be. Yes, you have been made to be that, but it may not materialize that woman if you don't make choices. Therefore, what is possible to complete it, to think of those views as what complementary. So Tega's view may be complementing what the scripture says, for instance, or what you believe a prophetic word to do, a traditionalist, those who believe that they went to, they went to Ibiza. They, they told them that your child, according to the God, will be so and so and so. I mean, the Greek stories you hear, the guy will sleep with the mother and kill his own father and stuff like that. It's typically something like that, as if that is what you will be. If you don't make choices, you won't get there, people. Some say, no, no, but destiny and reincarnation, and what was the other one? Shebra and, and, and Krabi, I see. So there is a destiny and there is this. So even if you do nothing, even if you don't learn, what will be will be people. Fatalism is not necessarily determinism. Being, having a fatalistic approach to life. All this is Otega because of the kind of questions I put together for your final exam. I don't like and I don't ask recall questions. I ask practical useful questions the questions are about actuality you use the concept but you contextualize them let it talk let it come alive so you you've seen some of the reflection questions i've given you in our presentations for you to have a fair idea but i'm not going to ask you to uh, to state the two parts of ortega's uh, maybe for the ie you can have such questions because you do it online and it is uh, you know Using the, the Sakai, you can type essays you know, for the interim assessment. So that place you can get record questions that are checking to see if you're even that you're doing some essays here. Your final exam will be full fledged essays. You have to write. 
I don't see, that's why I'm going through this for you to connect. So we, we've seen Plato, we've seen Ortega, and I have just reacted a little to those who were asking about. Uh, so does it mean that we don't have a preordained nature, even by faith? I mean, the, the people who believe, whether traditional faith or what have you. I said, well, you, you may just think of the two as complementary. So you have something that I have made you, Jeremiah, before you were blood clotting in your mother's womb, I knew you and I had ordained you to be a prophet, and so on, and so on, and so on. That is spoken of him. So it is as if he will be that. I say you'll be that regardless of what he does. I lay before you today life, death, but I advise you to choose life. Didn't you hear that? I put before you today the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. But I tell you, don't eat this one. Eat this. Did they obey? So God, who perhaps may have made you something, I say perhaps because some don't believe even that there's, a, there's God. And I'm not addressing only people of faith. I'm addressing people who don't think that this faith thing is anything to go by. And I respect that. And I want to hear why they say so. Perhaps it's because they haven't heard something else. Perhaps. Now, even if the person doesn't do faith, the question is, whatever you believe you are determined to be, people, does that take away from the fact that you have to make certain choices to get to that thing? doesn't take away from it. So you can reconcile the two and they play a complementary role. Have that in mind. That was for Otega, the substantive topic two, which we did in week three. Then we moved on to week. The next pile of questions, I moved from metaphysics and moved into ethics, trying to give you a feel of all the branches of philosophy that we can have, okay, the main branches. So we did some ethics, which focused on medical ethics and uh, business ethics. What was the substance? Business ethics and medical ethics here mainly introducing you to the ethical concepts by contextualizing them. Oh, what is check? We put them in something so that philosophy will not just be an abstraction, but it will respond to practical problems of existence, like the she says. You would have then looked at what is philosophy, how is it done, the approaches, the branches, the questions, the way people have misconceived it, you know, why. Examination is important, so Peter says, on examined life is not worth living. We've seen all that. That's lecture one. Slides given to you, people. So we saw informed consent. Make sure people consent to, you know, the, the procedure you're taking them through or the research you want them to do. They must consent, but the consent must be an informed one. Why? Because human beings are autonomous and they are beings that have dignity. And so you have to treat them, respect their what? Autonomy. But ensure beneficence, and that is ensure, like I'm dealing with you this month, I've been dealing with you this month, ensure that you do that which will benefit the student. And ensure, it's an ethical issue. I have an ethical obligation to ensure that. And I have to ensure that there is non-maleficence. You don't do that which will harm you yourself, or I don't do that which will harm me. I've got to make sure as an ethical obligation. If I don't, you know how will take me to court. It's not a legal matter. But it's an ethical thing. You have to be conscious of the fact that these people may not have guidance. You have to guide them so they don't harm themselves. That's the non-maleficence. We just put it in a medical frame. That's why. It was as if it happens only in the hospital. But you can go to the research field. You are going to interview the people at Nogoko, or that's in the news now. So we use all or two post palace or something. You have to make sure you are ethically grounded. You don't go looking for things and come and put in the public when you haven't received their consent to do that. Not just consent like they sign the document. Clarify. When we go, we are going to say this over here and over here. The chances are that it can attract um, NGOs to bring development to this nation. That's the benefit. But it could also attract denigration of the culture. People may look down on your culture or judge it and what have you. What are you doing? You are telling them the risk and the benefit of this research you are going to do with legal MC among chiefs or something like that. So that they now decide for themselves, there we go, that's informed consent, whether they want you to embark on that research or not. 
informed consent, therefore, is not just in the medical field. But we put it there to put content and make it, make it applicable. But it can move from there to politics. It can move from there to family. It can move from there to the church and how it is managing its resources, the national cathedral. We can raise ethical questions there. So ethics is broad. Bank ethics, business ethics, the lawyer's ethics, hmm? legalism, the ethics around the law. Is the moral necessarily, uh, what's the expression? Is the moral really the legal? Not necessarily, we've seen that. A lawyer can tell the, the client that, look, tell me, the, did you kill the guy? You can tell me, I'm your lawyer, I know how to. You can cover this up and blah, blah, blah. You know, some of the apologies, my legal liminary. So you see that? Just like we are, we are okay, let's, then the Christian faith believes that Jesus is advocating for us. When we are going to receive punishment for our killing, then Jesus will say, please, I'm here. Covering up for us. That's what he's doing. <laughs> Don't let it scare you too much. If I talk that, if you don't want to be alive. I'm just saying that they cover each other. Okay? They cover each other. Sometimes. Now, so what? So the ethical must be understood, and then there's a sense in which we may even be able to distinguish the ethical from the moral. Because it just started raining at my end here, I would want to check, can you hear me clearly? Right, though, can you hear me? Isabel? Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Okay. Yes, Thank you so much. Yo. So I'll continue. I was just saying, therefore, that Remind yourself of what we did when we introduced ourselves to the ethical. You saw the branches of ethics, metaethics, normative, blah, blah, blah. They're all there. Then we moved to talk about informed consent after we had thrashed out legal versus moral, uh, ethical versus moral, and stuff like that. After that, we then launched into what I, I used the whole session today to help more up nice for the first group. Sequentialism, deontology, emotivism, relativism, stressing strongly the difference between ethical relativism and cultural relativism, and why cultural relativism is not an issue for anyone, because it's an obvious fact that the cultures are different, the way people do things are different. But when it comes to ethical relativism, it is not as straightforward as that. Why? Because what is right or wrong? should not be prescribed by the culture, even if the cultures are different. As soon as we reduce right or wrong to culture or religion or what have you, we have a big problem. You have to think around that and play that record. And look at your slides that is available. I'll, I'll generate the link right after your slides. Now we want to move into another branch of philosophy, which is what? Epistemology. The study of knowledge. Samuel, please go ahead. I will you read this. I've not explained it. So that someone says, when we say knowledge in philosophy, traditionally, that is traditionally means that is how we've done it. We've thought of it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for some time now. It means justified true belief. You may want to look on your screen now. You believe the thing when you make a claim that is supposedly a knowledge claim, like I, I know the lecture. If I say I know the lecture, I mean, when you do a lecture studies in the, in the department, you will see knowledge by acquaintance, knowledge by so and so. There are different ways of thinking of knowledge. You know, people can say, Oh, I know Obama, or better still, now it's Biden. I know Biden, the American president. This sense of knowledge. <laughs> It's not like the one I know and the person also knows me, no. You can know by acquaintance. You are close to the person. You can know from like from a distance. You learn those ones later. Sometimes people say, I know who I am. And the knowledge they're talking about is what they have read. They've read it, but they've not done what the thing says. To have an acquaintance with it, to be connected to it. And Adam knew his wife. You see that the sense of knowledge there? Wasn't he living with his wife all this while? He didn't know that this is easy. You know, but this knowing is different. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's not talking about book knowledge or your head knowledge. Adam knew his wife, and they begat skin. It's intimacy, closeness. You are tied to the thing. 
there's Gnoski and there's the other one. So take note. Now I'm back to philosophy, we'll back, we come back here. So when the philosopher says, I know the lecture, it means you believe this claim, believe started. The claim is true. See that there's a claim of metaphysics there. There's a sense of an assumption of the things existing. If it is not there, how do you know it? Traditionally, it seems as if we say, I know, it means you believe the claim first. The claim is true. And there goes the third reason, uh, the third condition. You can justify that belief that is true. You can give grounds and justify that claim. Go on, say. Samuel, please go on. You're muted. How do we know? Okay, if Samuel is busy, let's take. Uh, once again, Joseph Watin. There was a TA called Joseph Watin. I'm, I'm sure I've said it before. Joseph, go ahead. Okay, Doc. How do we know? Traditional philosophy identifies two main sources of knowledge. That is, one, senses. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Collectively referred to as experience or empirical source. So well, philosophers would put the view. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So philosophers. Sorry. Okay. So philosophers who hold the view that experience is the true and ultimate source of all knowledge are described as empiricists. They include John Locke, David Hume, Bishop Beckley. Okay. Bishop's name is uh, pronounced Barkley, as if you are saying the dog barks. The E okay. is an A. Uh -huh. So you should back me. These three okay. names you see there are the, you know, we call them empiricists because they answer to the question of knowledge. How do we know? When you ask them, how do we know? They say we come to know anything we know through our five senses. Either we saw it, we touched it, so we know that the fire burns because perhaps. I touched the fire, it burned me big time. Now I know. But perhaps I didn't let it touch me. Someone told me, my senior brother or my senior sister said, this one, you don't touch it all. When you enter my lab, don't touch this. I could know it also from what I heard. I could know it by seeing how the lab technician touched that thing and my no mind, how he reacted, you could tell. So knowledge may come from seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, or smelling. All of them put together, the logic, excuse me, the philosopher calls the empirical from the word to experience it, senses, the senses. So when we say senses, we are talking the five channels that grab empirical knowledge. Anyone, therefore, who believes that the source, the free back source, origin of knowledge is the senses we call empiricists. But others do not think that knowledge is sourced from the senses. They think that knowledge is sourced from mind. And I quickly tell you, mind is not brain. Brain is a whitish, jelly-like substance in your head. I can touch your brain. I can scoop it out from it. Uh, is it a shell? No, no, not a shell. A soft one. I can scoop it out like that. I do if I eat human flesh. <laughs> but you cannot touch mind. So mind then, which is another source of knowledge, it's not necessarily your brain. No, not at all. Some think of mind as the soul, the non-physical part of a person. Some think of mind as spirit. See that if a person of faith, you say this is not discerned, by the senses, you don't use your senses. You use your spiritual eye. The lady enters your office physically looking very beautiful, smelling awesome physically, spiritually smelling big time, like she just came from the loom or she has some loose spreading all over her body. Someone may say, I know this one, not by sight. Taste not by my. <laughs> this is not by sight. If the person is saying, I sourced for this, 
from the non-physical. Some will say intellect if they want to sound academic. They are saying the same thing. It's still not the senses, but the intellect or the soul or the spirit, the non-physical part of me. Okay. Some put all together and use the word reason or rational source. So rationality is not necessarily brain. Okay, it is talking a different source than that which is physical. Anything that is physical is locatable in space and time. When we do rationality level 300, you will see how thinkers have distinguished mind from body. Mind is non-physical. It's not subject to space and time. You can put someone's mind into a container. I can put your physical body in the prison room and lock it. You are stuck there. But your mind can travel out and go to America and come. You can reflectively create a husband for yourself in your mind. People do that. Why do you what is going on in your mind cannot be restricted. See that. So you tell the person, sit down or physically she's sitting. In her mind, she's standing. You cannot restrict it. These there are ways that thinkers have distinguished the two. Now, what do we need that for? Come back to where we are now. We are trying to show you that some thinkers don't believe that true knowledge comes from the senses. They think true knowledge is from the mind. If you're a Christian, for example, or a religious person, I think other faith is saying, nothing in the physical is real. It is the spiritual that begats the physical. Anything you see physically was birthed out of what? The spiritual. So before you were a black cloth, I'm putting that one again. I mentioned when I was revised to take that with you. Before you were blood cloth in your mother's womb, I knew you. Blood cloth is before you even became a form for you to have oh, matter. Before you became material, matter is anything that has weight and can occupy space. Before you became material, crown. I knew you and I'd ordained you already. <laughs> so it means you should have or you would have existed in some form. That is not physical, that is not material. And I knew you then. Now you see Plato's discussion, see the relevance. Someone said, oh, so these things, and when we know it, then what? It helps us to see some argument you are going to make shortly, you see. If you are only rely on what you see, you see the brother's shoe, the colors of his shoe now, and you think this one, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Because you are inspired by what you see, and hear, and touch, and don't go on. This physical body and its gratification is all, all there is. But this bobby spanner, eh? this bobby on your chest, two mountains on your chest, will drop or it will, it will start dropping. It's just a matter of time. Go ask grandma, I told you. <laughs> all you see when it comes to beauty is your eyes. What your eyes are telling you, what you heard, what you saw. You will hear things that are not. So I'm going to engage Descartes and see why he's rationalist from the word rational source, which is really representing what reason. Reason is a word that captures the, the non-physical part of you. Not Reason is not brain. It may be the product of the brain, but that product is not physical. The brain is physical. See that? I said it may be the soul, the intellect, the spirit are collectively called rational source and authors like Plato, Socrates are immediately there, Socrates even before Plato, René Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, these are all authors who are, and I think that a good number of religious folks would definitely subscribe to the rational source, <clears throat> excuse me, as the true source of knowledge proper, even if the empirical helps us recollect or remember the true source of knowledge is what the non-physical very good but like i said after joseph oh, let's let me try to write your standby how do we justify our knowledge claims this is the most central question of epistemology how do we support ground or justify the claims of knowledge that we make what will constitute a solid grounds for our claims of knowledge? 
Whereas rationalists rely on mind, not brain, as a solid just, justification. Empiricists rely on experience, that is the senses. The contention then is which of the sources is the ultimate and true justification of our knowledge claims. Very good. I don't have to add anything there. So we are good to go. Thank you so much, Joseph. Be on standby. Please, I'll take bright now. Afterwards, Christabel, be on standby. I see Francisca. I see Franklin this morning. Christabel, go ahead. Hey, bright, go ahead. Key to understanding the text. What question is which which this? text is that? Say. So please read the title, okay? Descartes meditation one and two. <laughs> That's why you swept it, eh? Uh, <laughs> it's not Descartes. Eh? Okay, so let me help everyone. Everyone listen. We spell that's a French man's name, it's a French guy. So obviously it looks like the last name is not mentioned, the last alphabet is silent. Okay, and then D E S in French, we know it's day. Like you're saying day today. Okay. And le, les élèves. Les élèves. She D E S is day. So you pronounce that, that name as if you were saying today. Day, and then as if you are saying car, lorry, eh? the car that you move around, today car, Rene Descartes. But once in a while, we, we forget and then we add the end, Descartes. But at least it's not Descartes. So you, if you want to say Descartes in your mind, so that you are able to write it and spell it well, that is sounded Descartes. Okay? And he's a French guy. His book's title or the paper we are referencing is called Meditations 1 and 2. The meditations were up to six. Meditations 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So he got to the uh, uh, argument in defense of the existence of God. Okay? However, we will focus only on the meditations 1 and 2 for our purposes. When you advance, you can read the others. What is the, why meditations? You see what the scripture says? Meditate on the word of God day and night. Joshua 1 and so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, blah, blah, blah. Now meditate on it in the nature today. Should you chant, not necessarily per se, but reflect on it. So he was doing a reflection. That's what René Descartes was doing. Reflectively asking questions. So he's sitting in his armchair in the room. He didn't go to the field to do any research, questionnaires, no, no, no. Reflective. Deliberation, asking pertinent questions with his wine glass in hand. He was a religious person, at least we were told. He was frustrated by the continual deception that had gone on before. We thought the earth was in the center of the universe. So many theories were built around that. It turned out it was false. What? You thought your senses have taught you something. You wake up overnight. It was a lie all this while. Ah! Now, the question then was, what can we know? So say, read this, and then I will now project the document proper. Go ahead. Descartes' Meditation 1 and 2. Key to understanding the text. What question is Descartes seeking a response to? Is there any knowledge that is certain, indubitable, or that cannot be doubted? Very good. Indubitable. Or doubtful. Is there any knowledge? One of your colleagues asked me, I think when I was ending the other class, I don't. So it looks like all the theories we've learned, none of them is certain. Like, which one is the one that we must? I said, my brother, this is philosophy. Whose own should we use? <laughs> That's why it's always your view. After you hear all the theories, you want to know, will I look at the consequences when I have to make a decision? Or I'll look at the act, excuse me, the, the rule. Will I steal to save a life? Because I'm looking at the output. Will it, will it be okay if I say society is, is not going on, so I'll be stealing to take care of myself for school? What are you going to use it for? Maybe good. The means. Is it okay? Will you like your things to be stolen? So you, you don't have a certainty about which theory is quote and unquote the correct one. You see the problem? You cannot have that posture. The correct one. It might be your ability to integrate the various versions is what helps you know what to do at any point in time. 
that's what where we are being called to. People like the legalism. That shall not kill. That shall not kill. Well, God told the guy, when you go kill everybody there. Ah. That time he had already given that shall not kill. But he told Saul, when you go kill everybody, don't leave anyone out. Through the prophet. Kill everybody there. God called the fire from heaven to burn people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Meanwhile, God said, that shall not kill. God said, I am a jealous God. Be like me. Yet he says, that shall not be jealous. If you don't understand these things, you won't get the import. The point is, it's not the legalism. Do, don't do. It's your ability to reflectively, that's where comes the word meditation. Meditate on the heart of the law, not what the letter of the law. So what? So philosophy doesn't show you that this is the correct way. That is the wrong way. It wants you to think about the options. This one will take you to hell. This one will take you to heaven, for example. Eh? A lady before you light and darkness. Choose one. Otherwise, God would have made everyone programmed to worship him. You won't fail. But that is not that, that means you're not a human being. You're a stone. The sun doesn't negotiate, it has to shine. Human beings can choose because of what we are. And so philosophy grooms that feature in you. Philosophy makes you see. If we went consequentially, see, it can take us here. So we are all talking at the table and discussing. If we went the ontology, it could make us mechanistic. We'll see, we may have this challenge. So for this decision that we have to make, which one are we looking at? Voila, that is it. That is what we are going inside. A critical mind, reflective mind, objective thinking, open-minded person, working to do what? Respond to problems of this. Now, this is something like what Descartes was doing in the room there, trying to find out if it was a philosophical doubt. Is there anything that I can know for certain? Why is he looking for certainty? Because he cannot trust the five senses again. I'll read, uh, say, please read this one too, then I'll, I'll get Chris uh, Isabel to continue. Why is Descartes asking this philosophical question of certainty? The sources of knowledge into bracket senses have deceived him in the past and thus cannot be trusted. Is it wise to trust absolutely a source which has deceived you before? Examples, the eyes. The eyes deception of a marriage. Thanks, deception. Mirage. The word is mirage. mirage. You know mirage, everyone. Ah, let, me, let, let me come in here. When you are driving, those who drive, or if you are in a car, sometimes on a highway and the sun is very high up there. When you look ahead, you think there's a pool of water, like there's water on the road there. So when the water is very hot, you get closer, there's no water there. You get ahead again. It's a mirage. It's a deception. Perceive there's water. Look at your, uh -huh. look, you put ruler inside water. It looks like it's broken. When you bring it out, it's not broken. The eyes deceive us. That's all Descartes is showing. Descartes says, I don't know why I'm looking for certainty. I'm looking for a knowledge that I can be absolutely 100% certain about without any doubt. No doubt whatsoever. Descartes says, I'm going to look for certainty. Why? Because he doesn't know what to believe again. Believe absolutely without any doubt. And he's showing us why. When you read the paper, the one I showed you, I said it's a nine page paper. It's at your resource too. He says, Look, the senses keep deceiving me. What I thought I saw, I saw the guy's hand inside the suit. So I went to report with camera pictures. His hand was inside the suit. I went to tell them that's a tip. He's stealing meat from the suit. No, no, he was taking a dead fly out of it. I saw the guy putting the, the money in his socks, the referee. So I thought he had stolen. I went to check. No, he's not stolen money. It is his, his money, but because he'll be running, he doesn't want you to get me. So he put it in his sock. We had teeth, 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 teeth. We went to stone the person to death. Don't know we had killed Major Mahama. And he's so rest in peace. We didn't even give him the opportunity to say anything. The man is dead. A military person apparently sent there to protect the people. What then should we? Trust when the senses continually deceive us. We thought we heard Dr. Miles speaking. The lecture is coming. The person enters is Mohammed. Ah, 
But I thought I had your ears deceived you. The same yogurt that you enjoyed and you know, like when you are sick, it tastes the yogurt is bitter. Today is sweet, the same thing is bitter. How can you trust your tongue? We can go on and on and on. That's what Descartes paper tried to do. The first part, meditation is one of the things that we made out. He says, I cannot trust the same source that has deceived me before. Suppose you woke up and then join you, radio station, join you, gave an announcement, six o'clock. All the girls students should go to the total filling station at uh, whatever, post office or something at the Medina. They are giving free pizza. Free pizza. Some uh, pizza, pizza joint is doing free promotion. Excuse me. Papa's pizza has set up there. It's giving free pizza. Anyone who gets there before 6 30 will get a free pizza. Plenty. They go, student, it's your call. It's your call. Go. You have a 7 30 lecture. But pizza, na pizza. So you leave the lecture and run there. <laughs> my, my over thousands, whatever class. You all go there. When you go there, then the people say, ah, free pizza. They are not sharing any pizza. No radio universe. Oh, <laughs> oh join is there. Eh? We're just playing. We're just playing. I'm talking about deception. He, can, he has deceived you. The next day, this o'clock news. <laughs> yes, if you are laughing. This o'clock news. Then you hear. They go to them. They go to them. They go to them. You should all go to the dummy market now, not Madina market. This time, they are sharing free iPhone Pro Max. iPhone uh, 14 Pro Max. Now 15 Pro has come. Go there. One, the first 100 people that I get there, if you hear that news. What will you do? I'm going to run to Madina Market or Dome Market. It is not prudent, says Deka, to trust the same source that deceived you earlier. I'm very obvious. Why do you trust the guy who said, You are the apple of my eye, the lily of the valley, the this of the day? He was telling you all that. He returned from lecture that morning that he gave you all those pleasant things. When you returned, he was in bed with your roommate, the one who speaks strong. With syllabus like from here to heaven. That girl. She and your guy were inside your own bed there, making out big time. After he told you in the morning that you are the apple of his eye, I will never hurt you. How can I do that to you? I'm going to wait for you. We will be together. We live in a far island. And what? Sometimes I can tell you in a year. That is a sister in the Lord. You returned from lecture, two hour lecture, when you came, was inside the bed there. <laughs> Now, if he gets up and tells me, oh, you are so my lily of the valley, the apple of my time, the apple is eating. They crash apples. I don't want to be the apple of your eye. It is not prudent to trust the same source as the city. There's the cat. If so, then should we trust the senses when the eyes have deceived us? The ears deceive. It doesn't need to do plenty. Said. Just find one thing that the eye deceives you about. It will tell you that it can give you true indubitable knowledge. Indubitable means there is no doubt whatsoever about that knowledge. It is certain certainty. That is what you are reading on your screen. Now, someone will say, Why is they can't doing that? He's looking for what he can know for certain. So that what? So that how he got to know that one. He will use that channel as a foundation, as the source for true knowledge. Okay? So if he gets knowledge that is certain, then that knowledge can constitute the basis of all other knowledge that he has. He's looking for a foundation. Like you are drawing a circle. You want the compass to have a fixed point. That fixed point, if I measure the radius five centimeters and I have a fixed point and I fix my compass there, I'm talking about the compass that you use to draw circle, you know, the geometry. Then wherever I move my pencil, if I twist and turn the compass, I am certain in my mind that the distance will be the same. And so far as I have a fixed point around which I'm revolving. See that? So he's looking for certainty only to serve you for my screen as what? A foundation for my screen now. 
on where to build his whole epistemology. That's all that Descartes is looking for. Because if not, there is nothing that can be known for certain. So Descartes' method is described as a geometrical method, geometry. It's also described as a foundationalist approach to knowledge. I just want one thing I can know for sure, for certain, then that one will be the ground, the foundation on which I'm building the other two. The other two may not be certain, but so far as they are rooted in the absolute ground, I'm sorted. We may not be perfect, there I go again, but if I am rooted in a strong foundation in Christ, I take on Christ's perfection. You see what is happening, see the symbolism? So my perfection is derived from the perfect one in whom I believe. If you are building a house, your foundation is what holds the whole building. The cement and the concrete and whatever that goes to the foundation. It's not the same with the lentil or the block. But a strong foundation will hold the other things up there intact. So Descartes' methodology of epistemology is a foundationalist one. And it's a geometrical method. As soon as you have a fixed point, around which you are drawing yourself, you are revolving, when you go and go and go and go and go and go, you will come back home. Like the goat that has been tied to the tree in the house there, it, it can only go a distance. That's the, 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 the rope allows it. If I, 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 I tie a rope around the goat's leg or neck and tie it against a tree, it can move around, oh yes, but only so far as the rope permits it. There's a fixed point that he cannot wander about beyond that. Now, so Descartes' method is a geometrical one. What method is it? The method that he used to discover what? Certainty. Knowledge that has no doubt whatsoever in it. He's intentionally, therefore, see, see the point A now on your screen, systematically doubting. It's a systematic doubt method. It is a foundationalist approach, meaning that I'm looking for just a foundational truth. All knowledge can be perfect or indubitable, but at least the foundation shows so that from that foundation, I can build up the idea. And then it is also described as the geometrical method because he looks for a fixed point around which to revolve or move his knowledge. Okay. You see then that from there, he makes his arguments. And that is where my homework for you will come. So boss read this and then he got to this and I took it up to give you elaboration because of the rain. I hope that you are benefiting. So please read examples of why he doubts the senses. Examples. The eyes deception of a mirage. Thanks. Deception. Scientific theories turn out false, etc. The foundation on which he has built his former knowledge cannot be trusted to give him knowledge that is certain. These sources can give doubtful information, beliefs or opinions, but can they give him what he seeks? That is knowledge that is certain. That, that, is, that is his quest. Very good. Can these sources give him certainty? He says, no. So he adopts the systematic doubt, look at that, to intentionally doubt all the knowledge that he has acquired to see if there will be any left that he knows for certain. That is whether there can be anything he knows that he cannot subject to this doubt. Then why foundationalism? We call the approach what a foundationalist one because he says he will only look for certain truth, truth that is certain, indubitable to serve as a foundation or grounds or basis or certain point of his epistemology. So he is not looking for certainty for all knowledge, rather he wants certainty to serve as a foundation. If the foundation is right, then it will be support, it will support all the other knowledge builds on it, which on their own may not be certain. Now I ask you to think of Archimedes' geometrical point. What argument does Descartes use? Thank you, Bright. Let's take Christabel now. I appreciate it. Christabel, go ahead. Read very loudly, okay, so that you can have a good recording for your own benefit. For his argument, oh. okay, 
his twofold argument for doubting sensory knowledge. That is seeing, hearing, etc. One, the limitations of the senses argument. To doubt far and distant objects of sight, hearing, etc. Two, the dream argument. To doubt close and obvious objects of sight, hearing, etc. That is, I see things that are close and obvious, but only turn out to be false because it was only a dream after all. Therefore, I cannot trust the senses as a foundation for my epistemology. Note, this is an international doubt. So this is an what? Intentional. International doubt. Isabel, your friend is helping you. I'm intentional. <laughs> Don't worry, it's intentional. That's it, go on. But shut the up. Uh, I'm intentionally trying to see if I can doubt. So whatever possibility of doubt that I can raise, if it's possible, that I throw it out. Just so that I can arrive at something that I just cannot doubt. Then I'll use that as my foundation. Then I will trust the source that helped me attain that. This is Descartes' quest. And I tell you, it's a beautiful one. You are just sitting in your chair, in your room there, and you are reflectively meditating. The word is reflection, it's reflecting, thinking through. The people say, I told the anemic patient who died 18 years. That has failed. But the people who said it were really experts, they know what's up. Ah, what now? Should I trust? Should I trust them? They say cancer kills. I tried to do COVID 19, blah, blah, blah. It's the things they are saying are failing. They said that how many planets, nine planets. Now they said they are eight. They said that Ozolera is going to crumble down and crash us. You know, the person is reflecting me, going, what can I trust now? But maybe my mother told me that for men, they, they get you, they do you. This man, I thought, didn't do that. So the man is seated, this man, they had now, Rene Descartes, and he's reflectively going to what can I then setting about without any iota of doubt possible now possible in the future what is it that i can say that for that one day i know it for certain so he started showing checking the sources that give knowledge from eyes to nose to touch to smell to feel all of them put together is what the senses you remember and he doubted them by using two main arguments to doubt what sensory knowledge argument just means uh, uh, the premises he gave, the reasons he used to say that I don't trust the sense and discredited that that thought. Eh? He says, one, look, the reason why we cannot trust our senses, see, they can't be the one speaking, is because what? The senses are limited in its ability. If I am sitting at the lecture hall here, or currently I'm in my home off campus, I can't know what is happening in my office by my senses. It is limited. Maybe I can call so I'll hear. But I can't see. You are entering the lecture hall, you drive and park your car outside. When you enter the lecture hall, you don't see the car, you don't hear it, you can't touch it. So maybe it's not even there. The owner so called has come for it already. How will you know? You left your rice cooker with food inside at the hostel and found yourself a corner on campus to have your own life. Who told you that the rice is still there? <laughs> Who said the ice is still in the ice together? See, the owner has come for it. Came to fix electricity in the room there. That's what the fuel in the rice carried it and mixed it together and poured it into a rubber and left your thoughts pan there for you. You thought you knew that your rice is in the room there. Who told you it's still there? Our senses are limited. So if you can't trust it to give you true, indubitable, absolutely certain knowledge, that is the first argument. Because what? The limitations will restrict our senses when it comes to objects that are far away there and distant from us. See that? So the uh, University of Ghana tower, tower on, at the main campus, from a distance looks like it is spherical, round in shape. When you come closer, you see it's a square, or it has a, a, a square shape. Okay? That tells you that because of the distance, you may get an alteration to the correct 
see your face. It will alter. You think you heard the dog speaking because your senses are limited. You are not out there. You would have seen that the see a David speaking, not the dog. So limitations of the senses argument. We need that. When we want to doubt, according to Descartes, when we want to doubt far away and distant objects of sight, hearing, etc. So seeing something from a distance, you can raise the argument that our senses are limited. But then it takes us to the second point. What if the thing is not far away? The physical object of question, so far away, so close to me, like I'm holding my earphone now, and it, I'm certain that it's not far away for me to say it is square or rectangular or this. It's very close to me. What if we have to doubt close, obvious, sensory objects? Dega says, then we can still have you. I think I can still doubt something that is so close to me, like the laptop is sitting in front of me now. How on earth can I say that it's not the laptop sitting on me? It's not far away for me to say maybe it's not there, maybe it's not laptop, maybe it's no, 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 no. Right, right now it is in front of me. The guy said, think about what happens in a dream, my friend. Think about that. In a dream, a brother may dream seeing the sister he can't talk to daytime. But in the dream, he can see the sister, and the sister has become his wife, and they are doing the kiss the bride, and the guy's mouth is ready to do the kissing until. His roommate slaps him to wake him up. That shall he get up, maybe go later. Before he opens his eyes, his mouth is now, he has formed it ready to kiss. Why? But it was so real in the dream until you wake up. That's the difference. If you are not awake yet, everything looks real. I told your friends yesterday, we may just about be waking up to realize that not knowing there isn't any lecture. Called philosophical questions. Maybe the person is even the son of Elon Musk or some some rich guy somewhere, lying on a big mattress, you know, filling the whole room. His mates are waiting to go and bath him, like coming to America. <laughs> the Murphy. He wasn't in any shithole, you know, pardon my language, eh? Learning any some Descartes nonsense, so to speak. I want it to sound funny, eh? You wake up and say, Daddy, I just had a bad dream. It was a very bad dream. I was in some shit hole in Africa with some black folks, lecture, talking some nonsense, you know. Why? He just woke up. In the dream, everything will be so real. This is Descartes' argument. Until you wake up, people wake up running in their room towards the gate because they dreamt that a cow was chasing them. It was so real. Sometimes it comes into actual life. So, to speak. so what is the point there? If we can only know that we're dreaming only after waking up, then what makes us think that this close, obvious sensory object that I'm holding is so close to me, it's really there? I may be dreaming. Ah, if so, that I can even doubt the fact that it's a laptop to in front of me. Why? Because I may be dreaming. Those are people who hallucinate. You're working with them. You don't see anything. They say, oh, no, oh, no, it's coming, it's coming. You don't see anything so close. They may be hallucinating. They may be dreaming. If dream states and wakeful states look alike until you wake up, then even obvious and very close objects of sight and hearing can still be doubted because it could just be that there isn't any sister that you are doing, you may kiss the bride with. No, there isn't any sister. It is not real. You are just dreaming. If so, then we can't even trust close and obvious sensory knowledge. I just hope you get the, the way the man is arguing and how he's reflectively driving home a point until he arrives at what he can know for certain after all. In all this, remember, it's an intentional. Doubt. Any questions? I pause to take questions now. Very good. I see Quarantine's this one. I see Francisca and Kuma, Edmond Wilson, Missian Boachi Adam, Samuel Sandy still up, and Balame Ajo. Metabel, read the last, uh, the next thing on the screen. Afterwards, I'll take uh, Desmond Quarantine. Hey,
his argument. B, his arguments for doubting the knowledge acquired purely by the mind's activity, independently of sensory experience. That's it, prior truth. The evil genius, into bracket, demon argument. If I can conceive, if I can conceive of a possible being who is so powerful as to be able to conceive me, even about a proud truth, such as square is four-sided, two plus five equal to seven, then such truth, which do not depend on experience, could also be doubted. Therefore, I cannot trust the minds of I cannot trust the mind also as a foundation of my epistemology. Both sources have so far been discredited, but... Very good. Well done. I stepped out for a while, but I think that I suspect you may have struggled a bit with the word up there. So the A priori truth, you see it up there at the B, where he says, it's argument for doubting knowledge okay. applied purely by the mind's activity, independently uh, of sensory experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, you're able to eh? very good. So the word is a priori. A priori. I think it's Latin. Prior to. Okay, so prior to experience. Knowledge that we have prior to experience. Now, what is this third level of argument where he appeals to the evil genius or the evil demon, some would say the evil smart guy, a, a being that is more powerful than humans, but he has to be evil because he's going to deceive. He's going to appeal to the possibility that there could be a powerful being that deceives us when it comes to the other types of truths that are not sensory. So uh, let me explain them step by step so you get what he's doing. Now he has discredited the first source. At this stage, he has killed, or if you like, undermined the integrity of the senses, or the five senses, as a source of knowledge. It looks like the senses cannot be trusted. I told you, you can't trust Johnny Bravo. If he deceived you, you can't trust Joy News or Radio Universe if he gave you false uh, alarm. It's not prudent to trust that same source. With certainty, the word is certainty, not just, oh, we will believe him, we will believe him, uh, trust, trust him like that. No, 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 it's not that. I'm talking about reliable, indubitable truths. It gives that source, you, have, you want to say that that source can give you absolute certainty? Really? That's not prudent. So what? So we have thrown out the senses as a source of absolute, indubitable certain truth but there's still another channel there we go it gives us knowledge that's what one of you read earlier the two sources the empirical source and the rational source now when it comes to the rational so if you don't want to say rational the, the, the source that we call reason it's non-physical that knowledge is not given by the senses <laughs> you see so two plus seven, let me help you see why such truths are called a priori. They are truth or false is not dependent on observation. I may be visually impaired, and I, I sometimes it's amazing when you see, we see our special students on campus. I may not see, maybe I was born even without my sight. So I don't see two and I don't see seven. Two and seven excuse me, two and five, it's equal to seven. I don't have to see it, people. I have to understand it. So let me give the scenario I always give. Those who have played the past recordings, you would have heard this, this, this example. If I were visually impaired, eh, I was, and I was begging for arms, when you were assisting me, because you can see, but you don't have a good job or maybe something, whatever it is, so you're assisting me to beg for arms. Then someone passes by, let's say Dr. Miles passes by and says, oh, this gentleman, oh, sorry, I give five seats. Then you, my attendant, the person attends you, say, hey, your lecture came to pass. So I, I'm just so happy. We don't have that scenario at all. Special students are dignified. 
very respectful of themselves. They don't even do the big, 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 they were my students, I'm very proud of them. They come out of the country. So that is not even not alluding to anything at all. I'm just trying to let you see something that may be practical and help you understand a priori too. Now, they say, hey, the woman came to pass, so they left her to get your guy. They gave you five cities. They say, oh God bless her. So you That's told the uh, blind guy hmm, that you just received five cities. Then the Pope also was passing, or some priest or something. Was also passing. He also says, oh, take these two cities. The Lord bless you there. Eh? And you tell the special student or the person who is visually impaired, say, hey, this man too came to pass. He gave you two cities. Oh. You said five cities earlier. Now you say there's two cities added. I already told you the person is born blind. Hasn't seen two, two before. Hasn't seen five cities before. Now, when we finish and we close, no one else gave anything. We have to go back home. Then the blind guy says, Please, I have to buy, we have to buy food before we go. So how much do we have now? He said, oh, so the first one gave you five cities and the second one gave you two cities. So now we have three cities, okay? <laughs> what do you want our friend holding the white cane? What do you want him to do to the guy? The cane will talk about that. He will find him in the spirit and strike him without his cane and say, you were a thief. Two cities plus five cities is not equal to three cities. Now imagine that attendant say, ah, but you can't see, I can't see. I said two. It was two first and we added five. So it has to be equal to three cities. I don't have to see to know that you are lying. Mathematical concepts are understood. They're not seen. They are meanings, they are definition. If it is two and you added five, add, you didn't subtract, you added, it cannot be equal to three, whether I can see or not, whether I'm going to school before or not. You go and buy two years of clothes at the market there, Mokola. Two years. When you finish, you say, I've added three years. The woman selling to you, gave you two years, he there has three years. Then she asks you, so how many years have I given you? Or you say, you have given me one year. And see if they won't put you at the market. Don't oh, say, oh, but you have no go to come in. Let go on crutch. You know, I'm a gentleman from Lego. So what? Two yards plus three yards cannot be equal to one yard. Don't tell me I can't see. So I, 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 I can't tell that that is wrong. I don't have to see, people. That's all I'm seeing. It's not observation based. It's not sensory based. It's conceptual. If he's a bastard, he cannot beat his wife. Don't say, you didn't see it. I was there. This is not a seeing matter. It's an April truth. Truth or, how do I say it? A, a knowledge claim that does not depend on experience. Each truth or falsity is prior to, you see that, prior, before, a prior. So the truth is not dependent on experience. Experience meaning the five senses. Now, such truths like a square is a four sided figure. What we mean by square, really, is what we mean by four sided. Triangles have three angles. You just repeated yourself. You just repeated yourself. Triangle, three angles, is a three angle figure. What have you said? It's just a repetition, it's a tautological statement. So these claims are instances. That we call what a priori truths. They are not a posteriori. So I just introduced the other one. If a truth is posterior to, if it's a posteriori, it means after experience, then you get it. So it is experience that shows you. Sensory claims like the one we saw earlier are a posteriori truths. And we have already discredited them by the two arguments the one from the limitations of the senses. The other one from the dream argument. This is Descartes' work we are opening out like that. Now he wants to see how he can doubt a priori truth. Now you understand a priori truth, like mathematical truth, like geometrical truth, concept-based truth, truth, or claims that are true by definition. He says, I can still doubt that too. Even though it doesn't depend on experience, it's conceptual, it is possible 
for a powerful being. That's why he's a genius. He's a smart guy. A powerful being. Some say the devil. That's why some put demon. To deceive me about what a square should have been. We think that square is a four-sided figure. What if a square should have been three-sided? Or what if seven plus five, excuse me, two plus five should have been equal to 10? But my conceptualization has been corrupted by a supreme powerful being. And he goes further to say that being cannot be a benevolent one, a good one, because goodness cannot be got evil. So this must come from a being who, who has that power, but the power is used to deceive. Is that possible at all? Remember, it's an intentional doubt that you search for me to that. He says, if it is possible at all to conceptualize something like that, that an evil demon somewhere is the one deceiving me to think that two plus five equals seven, is that possible at all that I may be deceived? He says, yeah, yeah, it's possible. I can think of that. Then, even a priori truth can be doubted. They are not absolute. Now, both sources have been discredited. We don't know whether they, this is by the end of day one, the meditation is one. You can say, well, I don't know. As things are now, perhaps there is nothing that can be known for certain. Then that will tell me that at least I know one thing, which is that what I cannot know anything for certain. If you are following the discourse, you will see absolute skepticism, philosophical skepticism, and then the other one is what? Uh, 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 common sense skepticism. Descartes' method is not a common sense skepticism that we are all used to. We all have some doubts. Skepticism just means doubt. You, you, you are skeptical about things. Means you, you, you doubt. Everybody doubts something one way or the other. The reason why you hold a chair before you sit on it and, and, and hold it is because you are not sure if the chair can hold your body. You want to be sure. If they give you water, sometimes you want to drink it a little before you drink. Mm. Sometimes you look inside it a bit. When you are given a microphone to speak, sometimes instinctively you hit the tap. I'm told you shouldn't do that. Or you, you do hello, hello, and then you say, hey, okay, ladies and gentlemen, what did you do earlier? You wanted to check. But the people gave you the mic. But instinctively, common sense tells you, you want to be careful. You, want, you try to check. If they give you a, a new shoe for your wedding, you fit it. What are you doing? You want to be sure if it fits. It wasn't all to your size. That you, you said it's size 29, they got it for you. Why do you want to fit it? Because you want to be sure. So we express various forms of what? Common sense skepticism, which is normal. Then philosophical skepticism is asking deeper questions about what? What do we take for granted already? So how do we know whether it's raining outside? Common sense skepticism is just open the door and see. I hear petri, 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 but maybe it's just someone pouring water into their tank or some tanker has come to fill water. That's what the noise is. So I'm expressing common sense skepticism. The solution I will need is open the door and see there's <coughs> water out there, rain out there, then I can confirm. Now, philosophical skepticism will not be satisfied when you open the door and you say you see water. The question the philosopher is asking is, how can we be certain if it is rain or it is, uh, you know, the gods that are fighting and crying and that, something like that? So I'm asking a deeper question: How can we be sure if the handwriting that we think is, as we see, handwriting may not be his? We see finger on the gun. We saw the gun in the hand of the guy lying there. So we think that he killed the dead guy. Philosophical thinkers say, hold on, yes, we are seeing the guy in his hand, but what if? So the doubt that the philosopher is going to read is the philosophical one because it is questioning the obvious assumption. What you, you would normally take for granted is what the philosopher asks deeper questions about so that we, we improve and, and, and make sure that we are not perhaps accusing someone wrongly, for example. Okay. So the philosopher's question is deeper, the philosopher's doubt and the questions they ask are addressing deeper concerns about what obvious truths. Then we have the third type of skepticism. So I've just shown you common sense skepticism, what everyone has. We all raise questions and doubts about everyday life matters. 
which is healthy. You shouldn't be gullible to swallow everything that comes. The second one would have been the one we call the philosophical adapt. That's what Descartes is doing. He can see that there is a table before him. You can see that he's holding a wine glass. How did he see this? His eyes that showed, showed him that there's a wine glass. But he said, should we trust the eye to give us certainty? That is a different level. I am drinking the, the water that the eye showed me is in the glass. I'm taking it, I'm drinking. But when I start asking, is this really water? Like Plato did. I'm doing philosophy. It could be that this is just an appearance of what really is there. Okay, so philosophy is asking or a philosophical doubt just means we are trying to get into the deeper questions about the obvious. Then we have the third one, which we call the absolute skeptics or the absolute skepticism, which we will quickly critique and say it is not a consistent view at all. We have two slides to go, eh? so everybody psych yourself stuff. Which it is not a consistent view at all, the absolute skeptic view. What does it say? It says we cannot know anything. Cannot anything. The absolute skeptic's view says that knowledge is impossible. That means we cannot, it's not, there's no even ability. Not that we do not know everything. That's not the absolute skeptic's view. Not that we cannot know everything. That is not it. We cannot know any. Cannot and any. Not, not even one of them. Anything. That's a strict view. They cast a spare on, spare as in S P U R A, that they, they laugh at the idea of what knowledge being possible at all. Now, do you know what the problem is with that view? It's not a consistent view because if you say we cannot know anything, you want us to accept that as knowledge. You want us to say that we know that. We cannot know anything. That's knowledge. You just give yourself an evidence of knowledge. So claiming that we cannot know anything is itself a claim of knowledge. You just give us the evidence that we will use to shoot you yourself in the foot. When you say we cannot know anything and you want us to take that as knowledge, you are telling us that you want us to know that we cannot know anything. Ukwanansi and the Intikuma story. See? He thought he had put all the wisdom into the calabash. And he's climbing up to go and hide it. He keeps climbing and climbing. The thing is in front of him. Because he, he's protecting it. But because of that, he cannot climb. He climb and the thing will come. Because the Chikuma said, Daddy, Father, why won't you just put this calabash behind you? It's hanging on your neck. Hang it behind so you can climb easily. Why you go there and put the thing up? What you are doing there? You can't climb. The thing is in front of this, your big stomach and your big head. Nancy stood there and realized that I couldn't put all of them into it. I didn't gather all the knowledge after all. There's still one inside of this man, boy's head, and he got frustrated. The absolute skeptic is trying to say that we cannot know. By the time he finished, he has given us one example of knowledge. He himself he just gave us an example of something we can know, which is that what we cannot know anything. So we can know that we cannot know anything. That's why we say the absolute skeptic's view is self-refuting. It refutes itself. It shoots itself in the foot. It gives us evidence to critique itself. It's an inconsistent view. So absolute skepticism, we don't waste time on it. It means knowledge is possible. But we like common sense skepticism. It helps us move around in safety. Live in a world we didn't create. You are going to bath water. They've mixed hot water for you. When you go, no, you go and fall inside. You will burn. You have to feel it. You tap it, flap it, flap and see. Maybe the person is not mixing it. It's going to bring cold water. Common sense skepticism tells you, and also you didn't check the water. You went to buy the drug, you didn't check expiry date. Because you bought it at so and so shop, so no expiry. It could be that they were even moving the old ones. They couldn't pick the last one. A code is possible. Code it. Then you should express a certain degree of doubt. I hope everyone is following. So common sense skepticism is useful. Philosophical skepticism is extremely useful because we take so much as obvious. It is not obvious at all sometimes what we think is obvious. Is man free? Because based on the assumption of freedom, we hold the whole legal system. Like I told you in class last week, 
That's why we hold people accountable. That's why the rapist is in trouble in our hands. Why? Because we think and take it for granted that you freely chose to rape someone when you could have chosen otherwise. Now the question is, is man free? Could it be that what will be will be? Could it be that he was ordained to, be, to betray Jesus and so he couldn't have chosen to do otherwise? Could it? That's Ija Judas. What I just did and the questions I'm asking and the expression of this philosophical doubt is what? Is to elicit a deeper response about the obvious, the supposed obvious truth. We think that obviously people choose things by themselves. What if we don't? So philosophical skepticism is useful. Common sense skepticism is also useful to an extent, but absolute skepticism itself cannot be defended. And that view says we cannot know anything. You can look for the name of that author that stands out when you are looking at absolute skepticism. It comes from Ellis, it's called Pyro. Some say Pyro. Now certainty at last, last but two slides, I think. After all these things, this is a beautiful side. This is a productive side by meditations too, day two. When Descartes sat again to reflect and think through his search for absolute certainty, something hits him. He says, look, I have kept thinking and thinking and thinking. I thought that well now, looks like none of the sources are defense, depend, uh, what's the word? dependable. And it turns out that perhaps I may have to sleep knowing that I don't know anything. And he says, but no, hold on. I think I know something. I am sure about one thing. I know for sure that I have to exist. I, Descartes, now. He cannot be sure of your existence. How do I know that you exist? I see you. We don't trust the senses again. I hear you well. It's a senses. I don't trust the whole senses. For absolute certainty, you know. But I can touch you. Perhaps my, my sense of touch is failing me again. You don't exist. So the senses that helps me know that everything in the world, including other minds, existing, has been discredited. But I, Descartes, I can speak for myself. There's one thing that's for that one I am setting about it. That's what I exist. Anytime I am being deceived, whether by the dream watch, whether by the evil genius or the evil demon, whether by my senses, I have to resist before that deception can take place. If I don't resist, what is being deceived? I have to exist to be deceived. If I'm not existing, then how do I realize that I have been deceived by my senses or by the dream or by, what's the other one, evil demon? I have to be something existing to be deceived. Okay, what if there is nothing else but me? Well, to doubt that I exist, I have to exist to do the doubting that I exist. Wow, yes. Reflection. He says, so then any time I am thinking, any time I am doubting, any time I am deceived, I ing, eh? it is happening, conscious, the state of being. When I'm thinking or I'm doubting my own existence or I feel I'm being deceived, it rather establishes with certainty that I exist. Not even the benevolent God Almighty can deceive me, Baker, that I exist. Why? Because I have to exist for him to deceive me that I exist. Not me, I'm not existing. No, maybe I'm not existing. No problem. And I think I exist. No problem. Then what is that thing that thinks it exists when I'm small, it doesn't exist? I have to exist to be able to doubt that I exist. Voila. So what? So Descartes says, I think, therefore, I am. I exist. Mm -hmm. My thinking is what makes me realize that I exist. And thinking incorporates all the mental states that he mentions. I'm being deceived. So he tells me that I exist. That's what my own existence there is a lie. They can't deceive me about it. Not the dream, not the evil demon, not the external world, not the mirage. 